In today's episode on the Dive Saga channel, we are helping fight a deadly coral disease in the Bay Islands of Honduras. Today we are at the Whale Shark and Oceanic Research Center in Utila and research coordinator Sam is giving us a lecture on stony coral tissue loss disease. Corals are marine animals. In fact, what we perceive as a coral is actually a colony of thousands of marine animals. And in the case of hard corals or stony corals, well, they build themselves a hard skeleton, very much like we see here. These stony corals, they provide shelter for a lot of marine life, but they also provide protection for our coastal areas. However, there's a problem. Stony coral tissue blast disease is a disease that was introduced um, to the Caribbean from Florida, and it basically kills corals very, very rapidly and very quickly, and it's spreading throughout the Caribbean. At the risk of stating the obvious, stony coral tissue loss disease is a disease that causes stony corals to lose their tissue. The disease was first discovered in 2014 in Miami-Dade County and struck with a mortality rate of 66 to 100% of the reef. This rapid spread happened because the disease reproduces easily and when it was first discovered, no known cure existed. The sick corals die easily and once they die, all that's left is their porous skeleton that no longer reproduces. It's uh, white round lesions in the center of the coral and then they expand outwards and slowly cover the entire coral. Luckily, in the few years that have passed since, scientists have come up with a way to fight stony coral tissue loss disease. And today we're teaming up with the Whale Shark and Oceanic Research Center in Utila to apply such a treatment. We treat it with an antibiotic ointment uh, made from base 2B and amoxicillin, and we're able to apply it around the edges of the lesion and it can heal it. The amoxicillin and base to be paste mixture needs to be kept cold for it to remain effective. So Sam keeps it in a cooler full of ice on the boat. We set up our gear and take off to the dive site. There are dozens of dive sites around Utila and there simply isn't enough funding to treat every single site on the island. That's why the research center applies its grant money, which it received from Paddy Aware, to a strict number of dive sites only. A group of marine conservation interns are helping the team with taking measurements using this marker, as well as data collection. That way they can identify every single coral, its exact location, size, and the progress of the disease. It seems like a real bookkeeping nightmare to me, but it's essential because the treatment is costly and the resources are limited. Our goal is to keep enough large um, of our large coral genotypes around so that sexual reproduction can eventually happen and that there are still corals to get those gametes from. This disease is going to continue to spread to other places, so hopefully our experience here and our research here is able to help the future places that it spreads to. There aren't yet many locations who have a very solid answer on how to battle this disease and the clock is ticking. Right now, the coral that's most affected locally is this pillar coral or Dendrogyra cylindrix. On the few live ones that are left, we can clearly see the polyps waving in the surge. If the coral dies, the polyps die off and only a skeleton is left. Over time, this skeleton will get covered in algae and cease to exist. We get in the water and right away, carefully, a transect line is laid out across the reef. A transect line is essentially a long measuring tape that's always laid in the same location. 
This allows the team a reference point in relation to their mapping data and helps locating previously tagged corals. This fringe reef is shaped by cracks and crevices, so proper orientation is really important. While the team lays the line, I immediately notice thousands and thousands of juvenile sharp-nosed puffer fish everywhere. These little guys probably won't all make it to adulthood, so Mother Nature ensures that they are born in very large numbers, so a healthy amount of them can reach maturity. The line is ready and the team can now use the map to orient themselves. Once a previously tagged coral is located, the first task is to make sure the tag gets cleaned of algae. After all, the whole system relies on clear identification. These tags are either installed on nearby rocks or on dead parts of the coral that have no chance of revival. No live coral is ever compromised during the tagging process. Coral 021 over here has an active lesion. You can tell because the dead part is not yet covered in algae and there is a clear line of disease. Sam takes a picture with a ruler in the frame which will later help with determining the size and potential progression of the lesion. Then the syringes with treatment paste are taken out and the amoxicillin paste is applied on the lesion. The idea is to spread about 75% on the live part and 25% across the lesion, so the disease has to battle to gain terrain and will hopefully lose. Remember, the parts of the coral that are already dead will unfortunately stay dead, but the live sections can still be saved. Sam told me that, as a rule of thumb, only corals with less than 50% infection coverage are treated, and even then, only when the infected area is somewhat homogeneous. A little bit further on, we hear a banging sound. A newly infected coral has been found, and the team is preparing a new tag so they can add the coral to the map. Some reef inhabitants are clearly curious what all this noise in the neighborhood is about, but hey, it's for the best. Today, the team is tagging their hundredth coral. It may not sound like a lot, but if you see the amount of work that goes into surveying, treating and follow-up, it's actually a lot. When we get back on the boat, Sam tells me that on the way home, two team members are going to make a quick stop at one of the nearby dive sites. This dive site houses an exceptionally large brain coral and the team is giving it VIP privileges due to its size. When we get to the brain coral, I realize why it gets the VIP privileges. It's huge! Unfortunately, it still has some active lesions, so once again the treatment paste is applied. I get to try my hand at applying the medication. It's very important to press the solution all the way down into the grooves of the brain coral so the disease doesn't just creep underneath. Hopefully my efforts are effective, but we really won't know until in a few days from now. A little bit further on the same dive site is a live pillar coral, which is great to see and definitely presents us with some hope. The team keeps tabs on this pillar coral because it hopes catching symptoms early if they appear. Unfortunately, stony coral tissue loss disease is likely to stay around in the Caribbean for a long time. Hopefully the efforts that are being done here can teach us more about this disease, help contain the spread and help create knowledge to give other areas a head start in case the disease spreads.
One of the main reasons that I run this channel is because I enjoy informing people about scuba diving and our oceans. Sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's a little bit less fun, like today. But I've noticed that of all the people who watch these videos, only about 10% or so is subscribed to the channel. If you like content like this, you would really support the channel by hitting the like button, but also subscribing to the channel. Uh, I try to make new videos about every two weeks or so, usually topics like this scuba diving related. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.